What is the purpose of a laboratory on a train? Who makes picture windows without using glass? Where can puppies be bought on the installment plan? <laughs> Industry on Parade. A brand new look at our America. Produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Avery Island, Louisiana. More than 100,000 snowy egrets, ducks, and hingas, geese, and other wildfowl regard this lush subtropical sanctuary as home. And what a home it is, one of the most beautiful spots in North America. But Avery Island happens to be rich in more than beauty. For example, here are grown and processed all the hot Mexican peppers that go into Tabasco sauce. Brought to the island from southern Mexico in 1852, these spicy red peppers were the crop that sustained the Avery and McElhaney families after the Civil War, during which just about everything else on the island had been destroyed. The same two families still own the island today, along with the company that transforms the pepper pods, painstakingly, into a hot sauce known throughout the civilized world. The company makes no effort to keep the recipe for its sauce secret. In fact, you'll find it printed on every bottle. Tabasco peppers, vinegar, salt, and water. But there's one other very essential ingredient it doesn't expect any potential competitors to duplicate. That's patience. The ground up peppers are packed in oaken casks, which have small holes bored in the top. A layer of salt prevents any air from getting in, but allows gases that form during the curing process to escape. Thus protected, the peppers age through three summers. Only then are they ready to be made into sauce. The three-year-old mash from one cask is now measured out into a number of other casks for the addition of vinegar. A forklift truck rolls in to carry a cask to the vinegar room. Tools and techniques used here are a surprising combination of new and old. The modern truck hauls heavy loads around, and yet, most of the stirring is done by hand. They've tried mechanical stirring devices, but as yet haven't found one they think can equal the job done by hand. Thus, you have the picture of an individual agitating the sauce like this, just about as it was done a hundred years ago. While the sauce will go directly from the wooden casks into one of the most up-to-date bottling machines to be found. You might think this was enough of a product to be turned out by one little island with a population of only 1,400 families, but so far we've seen only a couple of facets of this amazing place. Directly under us is a mountain of almost pure salt, so huge it would dwarf Mount Everest, the biggest known salt deposit anywhere on Earth. The International Salt Company's been mining here since 1899 and has barely scratched the surface even though its mine shafts have gone down many hundreds of feet. There are rooms down here with ceilings a hundred feet high, where 25,000 tons of salt are blasted loose at one time. And up above, the egrets peacefully feed their young. Salt that's brought to the surface in the dry state is used as rock salt. But in addition, even purer salt is obtained by pumping water down wells drilled deep into the salt dome. Up comes a heavy brine that will be evaporated to produce salt for table use, for the manufacture of chemicals and a great many other applications in home, farm and factory. Salt and pepper, the basic spices of life, both found in abundance on one little island in the bayous of Louis people. Nothing is allowed to disturb the natural beauty of the place, nor the pleasant way of life of its inhabitants. When, in addition to everything else, oil was discovered on the island, the humble oil company contracted to tap it with the least possible disturbance of the island's character. After a well is capped, the shrubbery is replaced exactly as it was. God richly endowed this little segment of the Earth's surface 
And fortunately, the people in whose care it has rested for well over a century have more than lived up to their trust. For generations from the four corners of the world, people came to America to live under a way of life that gave them the spiritual satisfactions which could be realized only under personal freedom. Here they found religious freedom where they could worship in a church of their choice, political freedom where they could cast their ballots for a candidate of their choice, academic freedom which has meant better education for all, and finally economic freedom a private competitive enterprise system which has enabled all of us to attain the highest standard of living known to man. Along a right-of-way rolls a five-car laboratory on wheels, a train equipped with every imaginable device for observing and testing the performance of high-speed freight cars in actual operation. Electronic gadgets let the experts study every part of the car as it thunders along and help bring about improvements in everything from bearings to brake shoes. It's the sort of continuing research that produced the fabulous array of rolling hay here in Atlantic City for railway officials from all parts of North and South America. Some 200 manufacturers of railway equipment show off one-car trains, diesels more powerful than ever, double-decker coaches, and it's for improvements like these that American railroads have spent more than $8 billion since 1945. Here's a very light, very low streamliner from which dust and noise are sealed out by zippers between the cars. Not just novelties for display, but samples of the sort of equipment that has made and keeps our railroads the best in the world in handling the transportation needs of passengers as well as the cargoes of war and of peace. The city of Miami poses for a portrait from across Biscayne Bay. The photographer catches the modern skyline in a panoramic exposure that soon will be part of a mural many times the size of the negative in his camera. And Miami happens to be one of the important centers in which such photographic murals are manufactured. Photographers everywhere send their work to firms like the Film Art Company, there to be enlarged, hand-colored, and otherwise prepared for mounting on walls or ceilings. After the comparatively tiny negative has been carefully retouched, that part of it to be used in the mural is projected, ordinarily in complete darkness, of course, onto the light-sensitive photographic paper mounted on the wall. For greatest clarity and three-dimension effect, the clouds that actually floated over Miami when its picture was taken will not be seen in the finished mural. Instead, the upper part of the mural will show clouds especially photographed and the foreground, too, will be snapped, enlarged, and developed separately, so that the finished product will really be three photographs in one. A sample print of the enlargement is examined for focus, composition, and so on. Later prints will get special treatment to intensify contrast and give every detail of the 20-foot picture its proper value. The final print is glued in strips on large pieces of wallboard for easy mounting in office, shop, theater, or wherever it's to be used. The mural can be, and often is, glued directly to the wall, but this way is easier. Detail is further brought out and pictorial interest enhanced by tinting or hand coloring the mounted mural. From start to finish, each of these mammoth reproductions is a custom job. In banks, schools, sales rooms, in all sorts of buildings, the photo mural is creating a realistic picture window where before there was only a bare wall. It takes a lot of money these days to start a business and to keep it going. Recent studies indicate that it takes an average investment of about $12,500 to create a job. Investment in building space, supplies, power tools, and all the other things a factory employee needs. Today, there are an estimated eight and a half million shareholders, Americans in all walks of life, who own shares in these tools through their investments in America's business and industrial corporations.
industry on parade visits a type of businessman whose ears are filled with the yipping of puppy dogs and the happy shouts of children, the kennel operator. Professional dog breeders have their hands full these days, trying to keep up with the demand for pets, especially when, as here at Amher Britt Kennels in Hempstead, Long Island, the pets are of the relatively new breed called boxers. Here's a boxer that was sold six months ago and has been brought back for free obedience training. Let's see how well she's learned her lessons in just a little over a week. As gentle as they are sturdy and handsome, boxers also are very responsive to the right training. She reacts instantly to voice or hand signal, but the master must always make the signal the same way and insist on strict obedience which should be frequently rewarded with demonstrations of affection. A novel practice here is the application of the same installment payment privileges to buyers of dogs that apply elsewhere to buyers of automobiles or refrigerators. A pup can be taken home for $10 down and $5 a week which puts a fine dog within the reach of families that would be hard pressed to raise the full price at one time. This father for months has been hearing urgent pleas for a puppy from three youngsters who aren't aware of the limits to which a weekly paycheck can be stretched. Now the cost of giving this little fellow a good home can be stretched out over a period of months. Papers exchanged include a guarantee that Brownie, or whatever his name is going to be, is free from physical defects or illness. Boxers started coming into their own in this country only after World War II and are currently enjoying great popularity. There's one boxer whose popularity is assured, at least with the three young dog lovers who live here. They can't even wait for Pop to get out of the car. Out the window comes Brownie to receive a welcome he'd just as soon do without. Oh, well, Brownie seems to be saying it's all part of a dog's life. Now another group of industrialists are launched in business. And if they can keep from drinking up the profits, it won't be long before they've helped Pop pay off the mortgage on good old Brownie.